Our world is changing. Every day, it changes a little faster. Some changes are too small to see. Others, too big to handle. Sometimes, change feels slow. So slow, we don't even notice. Other times, it happens all at once. And we can't keep up. For our climate, change means many things. And between too small to see and too big to handle, there is a whole world of difference. The clock is ticking. This is Bloomberg Green. The electric dream has a price. This week, when will batteries be cheaper than oil? $100 per kilowatt hour is the magic number. We break down what it means for electric cars and how close we are. London to Amsterdam on a single charge. We talk with one of MIT's 35 innovators under 35 about battery-powered flight. And next stop, Electric Avenue. One California company is in the business of making public transport greener than ever. From Bloomberg's headquarters in New York, I'm Kaylee Lines. This is Bloomberg Green. Governments, businesses, and the climate conscious are pushing hard for a transition to electric vehicles. But before that can happen, a key problem needs to be solved. Price. Ed Ludlow breaks down the economics of electrification. Batteries need to get cheaper before electric vehicles can become more mainstream. According to Bloomberg NEF, the battery pack accounts for anywhere between 25% and 40% of an electric vehicle's cost. Prices have come down by almost 90% over the last decade. Still, we're a ways from hitting a magic number for batteries, $100 per kilowatt hour. That's the price at which EVs should achieve price parity with the nearest equivalent gas guzzling car. The price of the average pack now, $156 per kilowatt hour. An EV uses rechargeable lithium ion batteries similar to those that are in your laptop or mobile phone. They're just bigger. The batteries are expensive because of what goes in them, namely a small selection of energy dense metals. And we're not just talking about lithium, but cobalt, nickel and manganese too. Those metals can account for around 45% of the cost for the battery cells produced by the likes of Panasonic, LG Chem and China's CATL. The cells are installed in modules throughout the battery pack to safely and efficiently manage the discharge of electricity. Inside the cell, lithium ions shuffle back and forth between the anode and cathode. The casing around those ions keeping them tucked in is what's made of the energy dense metals. Now, cobalt has been preferred because it stops cells overheating or catching fire, but it's expensive. So one way to make batteries cheaper is to switch from cobalt to more nickel. Not only is nickel cheaper, but it also holds more energy. But that's not without complications. Nickel-based batteries require manufacturers to spend money on safety adjustments. As part of a pledge to halve battery costs, Tesla CEO Elon Musk recently unveiled new cell chemistries that use less or even no nickel, and they ultimately remove cobalt too. Tesla also has plans to use silicon, one of the most abundant elements on Earth, in its battery cells. There are also concerns around nickel being in short supply. Contracts for the metal rose almost 30% between January and October. Fortunately, those higher prices could spur investment to find new sources of supply. So how long do we have to wait before the battery costs come down to a level where EVs will have price parity with combustion engine cars? Bloomberg NEF forecasts that we're only a few years away. It says that battery pack prices will fall below that magic $100 per kilowatt hour number by 2024. Analysts are expecting newer designs and better manufacturing practices too. Venkat Vishwanathan's work on reducing the cost of electric car batteries has earned him a place on MIT's list of 35 innovators under 35. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hardern spoke to the Carnegie Mellon associate professor about creating batteries that hold more energy and what they could lead to in just a few years. Battery cost is an important metric with which electric vehicles are judged. And in order to bring down the cost, there are one of two ways. One is you bring down the cost, so you use cheaper materials, or the other way is you increase the energy contained in the battery for the same cost. So 
uh, a lot of my work has been focused on making new batteries with materials that would be very similar to the materials that are used in current lithium ion batteries but then they would produce more energy so that for the same cost now we bring down the overall cost per energy and that will then enable cheaper electric vehicles longer range electric vehicles the technology that we've been working on is to substitute the current anodes that are used in in current lithium ion batteries which are graphite to a more uh, energy dense lithium which is sort of in our field called the holy grail so we made some extraordinary progress on that problem. A car's mileage on a full tank would usually take you much further than an EV. When will batteries have the capability to match that? The capability to match that really depends on having lighter, more energy dense batteries. Right? The best batteries we have today are still much, much heavier than gasoline. So I think uh, in the next half a decade, we will see sedan market, we will have vehicles that will have ranges of the order of 500 miles. If you're in a internal combustion engine vehicle and you run out of gas, you go fill it up, you could do that in under five minutes. When will we see that level of convenience with an EV? 15 minutes uh, is I think the aspirational goal that has been set for our industry, which means you get in and then for you to fill from 10% of your state of charge to 80%, so 10 to 80% you refill. That happens in about 15 minutes. That's really the, the target that the community is shooting for. There are lots of progress towards that. Uh, I think I'm fairly confident that we'll see 15 minute recharge times. Five minutes is very tough. Uh, the batteries are internally crying when you try and charge them at five minutes. I wanna also ask you about EVs, I guess EPs, um, electric airplanes. I, I mean, am I getting ahead of myself here? I know you've done some research on it. No, you're not getting ahead of yourself. So uh, I think electric planes are sort of falling in two buckets. One is what is called uh, flying taxis popularly, small flights uh, between you know Manhattan and JFK and things of that kind. Those uh, actually look very, very promising because the battery technology you have today can get you, uh, maybe with some improvements, uh, can get you to ranges of the order of a uh, you know, few tens of miles per trip so that you can actually start to take meaningful trips. You will move from the two-dimensional roads to the three-dimensional skies and, and sort of be traffic free. Now, in terms of regular planes, that turns out to be much harder. The, the question of when uh, we might take a flight from, from London, uh, London to New York, that is probably uh, not in the foreseeable future unless uh, we change the elements in the periodic table. I'm 35 now and by 40, I wish to take a meaningful flight in a flying taxi by the time I turn 40. So, so that's sort of my, my open prediction. I think it will actually change the way people live, right? I think people are going to um, live uh, in areas that maybe are slightly further away. I think it will allow people to visit places that they would have not visited. So I look forward to a future where I can, I can take my vertical taxi when I go on vacation. What are you most excited about in your field? in the next five years, what do you think could happen? I think in the next five years, we we, uh, we will break the massive target that was given for the community by DOE, uh, which was $100 per kilowatt hour. You know, depending on who you ask, you know, we're already there or we're very close to there, but regardless, we'll break it uh, at some point. Uh, so I think that will be the monumental achievement of the decade for our community. At the beginning of the decade, uh, when the goal was announced, the cost was around 2000 so bringing down cost by a factor of 20 was unimaginable. And, and what that means for, for an EV is unthinkable, right? The battery cost for the earliest electric vehicles were off the order of $80,000, just the battery pack, right? So now from there to now, we have battery packs that are off order of the cost of $5,000 to $8,000, right? Which is what makes the EV revolution possible. Coming up, a former Tesla executive thinks bigger. How electric startup Proterra is trying to make public transport in America all electric. This is Bloomberg Green. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York. This is Bloomberg Green.
For the latest climate news, here's Jennifer Zabazaja. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in New York. Here's everything you need to know in green this week. Joe Biden picked John Kerry as his climate czar. The former Secretary of State helped broker the landmark Paris deal and is a veteran of Washington politics. It's the latest sign climate change will be a key priority for the next president. The coronavirus pandemic led to the biggest ever drop in U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Bloomberg New Energy Finance says they haven't been this low since 1983. For context, that's when Return of the Jedi was in theaters. Emissions are set to rebound next year, but will likely be at a three-decade low. Want to know what's happening in the ocean? Well, look to space. A group of scientists from the U.S. and Europe have just launched a new and improved satellite to track the rise in sea levels. It can measure 90% of the world's oceans down to a few centimeters. And the U.K.'s richest man is teaming up with Hyundai to take hydrogen-powered cars mainstream. Jim Ratcliffe is looking to produce and supply the gas to the Korean car maker. He may use Hyundai's fuel cells in a new SUV he's planning for next year. While the focus for electric car makers is on making things smaller, one clean energy startup is thinking big. Proterra is leading the charge on making a carbon-free urban commute. I pay a lot of attention to what's going on in environmental sustainability. In most of the places that we live, if you even reflect back 10 or 15 years, the climate literally is changing. There is no planet B. And I believe that my kids, when they're adults and when they're actually at a point in their career where they can make a difference, it will be too late to have made a difference. For Ryan Popple, business is personal. Regardless of where you work, I think you've got to be asking tough questions about what are we going to do to actually solve this problem. The co-founder and executive director of EV startup Proterra is determined to usher in the age of clean energy. The technologies are now largely in place to solve the climate crisis. And for his part, he's focused his crosshairs on a sometimes overlooked contributor of carbon emissions, buses. Buses and freight trucks combined comprise about 30% of the world's carbon emissions from the transportation sector. Replacing internal combustion buses with e-buses is well in the works, and electric buses are poised to take over half the world's bus fleet by 2025. But there's one problem. Almost all of them are in China. As of 2019, China had already amassed a fleet of over 420,000 electric buses. Europe was at just over 2,000. The United States, about 600. Today, electric buses make up less than 0.1% of America's public transportation fleet. So now we got to ask ourselves, well, if, if China was able to get it done and eliminate 200,000 barrels of oil per day by switching their bus fleets to electric, then we ought to be able to get it done as well. The good news is that while diesel buses have been getting more expensive, 3 to 4% per year, electric buses keep getting cheaper and they keep getting better and they're a much better user experience. We want to win using market forces and be completely independent of whichever way the political winds are blowing. After college, I served in the, in the U.S. Army, and that's really what transformed my view around energy security. Just seeing how volatile some parts of the world are, in particular parts that we're very much dependent on for, um, for fuel production or petroleum supply. Every day the world needs about 100 million barrels of oil. And so that is absolutely an unsustainable situation. The answer to energy security is going to be finding alternatives to petroleum. It's not going to be trying to produce more petroleum. After his tour of duty, Ryan went to business school and landed himself a job at Tesla in its early years. My reason for being at Tesla was not because I was a sports car enthusiast. It was because of the clean tech aspect of what Tesla did. You cannot solve the congestion problem simply by making cars cleaner. A big piece of the sustainability story around Proterra is the benefit of mass transit. This was a way to get clean EV technology into the absolute mass market right now and not wait for electric cars to be cheap enough for everyone in the economy to afford them. Today, Ryan heads the charge for zero emission battery electric buses in North America. 
manufacturing its own vehicles in facilities in California and South Carolina, Proterra has sold over 900 electric buses to transit agencies throughout the U.S. and Canada. Based on the promise of lower operating costs and less noise and pollution than diesel buses, the company says its city bus can go about 350 miles on a single charge, over twice the distance of an average city bus's daily mileage. Throughout the EV world, the best products are going to be those products that were purpose-built and designed from scratch to be an electric vehicle. We make our own chargers, we make our own battery modules, we make our own packs. We vertically integrate into any technology where we find that the, the existing supply chain isn't good enough for where we're trying to go from a performance basis. To make the cost benefit more attractive to local deficit hawks, Proterra has innovated a battery leasing program allowing cities to go electric at the same price point as a standard diesel. When you buy a diesel bus, you don't pay up front for 12 years of diesel fuel. That would be hundreds of thousands of dollars of capital expenditure. So what we do is we break the battery out of the cost of the vehicle, and then they pay for the battery over time like it was the fuel. And that's enabled a lot of cities that, that might not necessarily have the capital to make the switch to be able to do so now. Proterra is already moving beyond city buses to electrify other types of large vehicles. They've recently begun delivering electric school buses with their partner Thomas Built Buses. The company has secured over $500 million in private investment to date, much of it from automakers, which seems to vindicate Ryan's pro-business approach to sustainability. Technologically, we are at the moment where we can start really scaling clean energy solar, wind, energy storage, energy efficiency, electric vehicles, charging stations, these are the high growth industries of the 21st century. If investors can make better returns investing in clean energy technology, then it really doesn't matter whether or not you convince anyone that it's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. Coming up, Elon Musk says Tesla is working on a car that can do a thousand kilometers on a single charge and suggests he could make a hatchback. But is he for once behind the curve? This is Bloomberg Green. Governments unveiled over $12 trillion to stop the economic fallout due to COVID-19. And for a full recovery, trillions more will need to be spent. In March, the U.S. Senate passed a $2.2 trillion stimulus bill, with nothing specifically for green interests. China has published an ambitious slate of energy-efficient infrastructure goals, but it has also rolled back regulations on coal plants. And around the globe, green measures account for less than 1% of the total coronavirus-related stimulus spending. In contrast, some 7% is specifically targeted at carbon-intensive companies and sectors like transport, industry, and oil and gas. So what are the implications for the future? After the 2008 economic crisis, carbon dioxide emissions dropped 1.4% in 2009 before rising 5.1% the following year when the economy started to bounce back. The most efficient solutions for rebuilding the COVID-ravaged economy are those that also reduce carbon emissions. An Oxford economic policy study published in May of 230 central bankers and economists cited policies with major climate benefits, such as clean energy research and infrastructure, disaster preparedness, and zero carbon transportation as the preferred public sector response. The study asserted that unless policymakers keep carbon emissions top of mind, 
the world risk leaping from the COVID frying pan into the climate fire. Elon Musk has never shied away from talking about his ambitions, but his latest plans will stretch the boundaries of what is achievable for electric cars. Our longer range vehicles have um, a range uh, over 600 kilometers. We even have uh, some under development long term that can do 1,000 kilometers. The very difficult part is then scaling up that production and achieving ex extremely high reliability and safety. Things have to be done at extremely high volume. Um, so that means a very big factory. So there's just a lot of talent, um, talented designers and uh, engineers um, in Europe, of course. And uh, it would, I think, for a lot of the best people, they really want to work somewhere where they're doing original design work. In Europe, it would make sense to do, um, I guess, a compact car, so perhaps a hatchback. It helps us also say, okay, we need a car that people can afford, uh, that fits their lifestyle. Let's bring in our green reporter, Akshat Rati, for more. Akshat, why is Elon Musk prioritizing Europe? Europe has a goal to reach net zero emissions by 2050, which means cutting emissions from all sectors of the economy, including transport. And to do that, uh, Europe is going to have to incentivize uh, selling electric cars, both from the automakers by putting restrictions on how much emissions their average fleet can produce, and for consumers who will be given direct subsidies so that they can buy these cars for slightly cheaper than what they're available at. Well, for these cars to work, you have to have batteries. How does Europe's battery making capacity compare to the rest of the world? Europe is lagging and the, the big uh, behemoths are China, South Korea and Japan. And that's a problem because unlike oil and gas, which are commodities you can ship around the world for relatively low cost, you can't do the same thing with batteries. So you're going to have to build manufacturing capacity in Europe. The good thing is governments have recognized that that's a challenge um, and they are helping automakers come up with ways in which they can either make battery factories, these large gigafactories cheaper through direct subsidies or find partners that can come and bring their wares, such as Tesla, but also Chinese battery makers like CATL, to Europe to make these batteries. Well, you say Europe is lagging. Just how late to the party is it on EVs? A fair amount. Uh, not quite, uh, you know, it's not lost the race yet. Uh, but as I said, the, the manufacturing capacity has been in Asia. And so they've developed much of the innovation around how to make batteries cheaper and get them into cars. Of course, Tesla and Elon Musk were quite ahead of their time, so U.S. has capabilities to innovate on that front. And much of European automakers have to play catch up. Uh, the good thing is they've recognized that challenge and are spending a lot of money to get there. When they do catch up, how does that impact the jobs picture in Europe, especially those who work on internal combustion engines? Very good question, because these jobs aren't transferable. People who work on internal combustion engines aren't always skilled at uh, making electric cars, which are all about batteries and electric motors and software. So what you need is a bridge program where you can transition these workers uh, and train them up and make them work in the industries of the future, which are cleaner and something we need for the environment going forward. All right, Akshat Rati, Bloomberg Green Reporter, thank you so much. That's it for this week. Keep the conversation going. Follow us on Twitter, at Climate. In New York, I'm Kaylee Lines. This is Bloomberg Green.